Hello, hello my emperors and empresses and welcome back to Bumblebee. Today we'll be counting down the top 10 unusual traditions from the Ming Dynasty. Starting at number 10 is wood blocking. The Ming Dynasty was a prosperous era of China and one of the main reasons was their invention of color print wood block, paper and two tone color printing. It surpassed all preceding printing techniques that were around before. What made this unusual however was that the Ming Dynasty continued to progress in printing, something that had been studied and slightly advanced by the previous Yuan Empire. Despite many scientists having thrived during the Yuan Empire, much of their culture as well as their inventions were destroyed to rid the country of Mongol influences after the end of their empire, as the Ming Dynasty aimed to re-establish the traditional Chinese values the way they saw fit. When they held on to the Mongols' advancements with printing, it's because they were also incorporating new technologies from European trades. The original printing had spread literacy among all classes, but it was struggling as there was many Chinese characters to use and not enough in set print. So the the Ming Dynasty built off of this invention and created moving metal stamps and a machine that could move and swap the tiles around. This printing machine incorporated Chinese printing methods with the European printing press and the newfound moving technology that made printing easier than ever. The dynasty name is number 9. Unlike kingdoms and empires found everywhere else in the world such as Greece, Rome, the Ottomans, to name a few, a Chinese dynasty was named by and after whatever family heaven deemed appropriate. Chinese emperors believe that the heavens bestowed them with a hereditary divine mandate to rule, thus their official name Tianji, which officially means son of heaven. If the heavens saw fit for another family to have this title, it could be withdrawn and bestowed upon them at any given time. This could be in the form of war, an emperor being conquered by another family, or subjugating the throne or a coup. This is why ancient China has different emperors and empire names to different time periods, Ming Dynasty, Zhang Dynasty, Jiajing, to name a few. As a result, emperors spent a lot lot of time and resources to try and ensure the continuation of their family on the throne. Rituals were one of those resources. Many rituals were seasonal and by the time the Ming Dynasty was in place, there were an average of one a month. They could be performed in dance, movement and sacrifices, the only one practiced by members of the Ming court. These rituals would be debated and revised under each dynasty leader. It was crucial that any sitting emperor perform them to demonstrate how he was the rightful emperor as it validates their position within the system and thus validates the system itself. We'll be circling going back to talk about the mandate of heaven ideology at a later point. Number 8 is the 9 kneeling rituals. The practice of kneeling isn't seen much in many other ancient cultures, but it was one of the most common daily traditions and social customs in ancient China. There are 9 categories even, and they are acutely named the 9 kneeling rituals. Among them, the first 4 are seen consistently in daily life, and the other 5 are only more for special occasions. A special occasion could be a funeral or addressing a serviceman or woman. The grandest of kneeling was reserved for officials meeting their emperor, and we'll be covering that in another part of the countdown later. Some more commonplace occasions would be newlyweds kneeling three times in a wedding ceremony, or hosts of an event expressing greetings to all, even how a junior must always kneel to their senior. What started in ancient times as a practical greeting developed into a way to express respect, obedience, gratitude, love, and more. Number 7 is the worshipping of heaven, earth, and ancestors. As I mentioned, rituals were one of the emperor's duties. and Annually, he would fulfill the religious responsibilities of the Temple of Heaven ceremony. The emperor would make the journey up to the temple. When he worshipped there, it was believed that he was worshipping heaven and the earth as his symbolic parents, upholding the ancient ideology that the emperor was not divine but divinely appointed. This differs vastly from many kingdoms where men would appoint themselves as god status, as you might have heard in a lot of our other videos. This worship was a way to ensure society was in natural order, an aspect of cosmic order of heaven, earth, and society as a three. Also by worshipping his own ancestors at the temple, which is filial loyalty and an obligation of all regardless of social stature, it was believed to strengthen a dynasty hold on the throne. So let's talk more about the ritual in number six, the three prostrations and nine katows. When the emperor worshipped at the temple of heaven, he executed the ritual of the three prostrations and nine katows. Under the command of a high ranking court member of the emperor's choosing, he would be told to prostrate. It's kind of like planking and then katao, a type of kneel that you do once, twice, and then a third time. Each time the emperor would be touching his head fully to the ground. Next, he would be told to rise again, then repeat another sequence, and another, for a total of three prostrations followed by three kneels. This ritual was important for more than just the emperor. The phrase, from imperial court down to our village, was commonly found in widely 
widely circulated documents of the time. That's because a ritual like this could be performed by an ordinary farmer at his father's funeral or a parent blessing their son. People use this ritual, as well as its widespread use, as an expression of interconnection and commonality that broke boundaries between social class and status. Unique utensil guidelines is number five. The Ming Dynasty was one of many dynasties to have limitations on utensil availabilities throughout the status rank. Household items weren't just bought and used at random, and oftentimes a piece could have a very specific purpose even for just one dish alone. First up is how precious golds and solid jade wares were only used for the royal family, not even their courts or high status officials. Let me emphasize that again, solid jade utensils. This was written into government regulations as early as the Tang Dynasty. Anyone found breaking these regulations could be punished and the items confiscated. There were a few small stories of this in the Ming Dynasty with concubine thieves even. Similarly, rosewood lacquered wood was only for the royal families. You couldn't even buy the lacquer, it was purely resourced and provided to the royal family carpenters. There were even stipulations on the right to use certain garments and tools made of certain materials, but also that had specific aesthetic visual. For example, certain tent shapes were reserved for royal family, and bed clothes couldn't be made out of certain materials. I will say, it would be absolutely spectacular to have a meal cooked in a jade cauldron, stirred with solid gold spoons, and then served in more jade with more gold utensils. They really had luxury down packed. For number four, we learn what is the mandate of heaven. Alright, so I said we'd cover this a little bit more. We're going to use the conquering of the Ming Dynasty to explain, as this mandate existed before and after the Ming Dynasty, and was how they even became a dynasty in the first place. When the Manchus conquered and overthrew the reigning Ming Dynasty to establish the Qing Dynasty, they announced how Ming had lost the mandate of heaven. However, they continued the worship of Ming emperors throughout their 268 year rule. Why do this? Because the mandate of heaven was centered on the principle of legitimacy, meaning that the Ming and the dynasties before them had the legitimacy and held the mandate at one point in time. To reinforce the claim on the mandate, they acknowledged that the Ming's legitimate claim to it was in the past. So, so, as unusual as it may seem, by continuing the worship of the Ming emperors, they asserted the legitimacy of the Qing dynasty system that could be dictated who's rightfully to be a Chinese emperor, as I previously explained. This mandate by worshipping the previous Mings allowed them to present themselves to the populace as the sons of heaven, rather than as conquering foreigners who had no legitimate claim over China. This was done by anyone who conquered China as foreigners in order to be seen as the new power. Once in the title of mandate of heaven, the the emperor was the mediator between heaven and earth, and a major participant in all cosmic actions. He must conduct himself as such, or there could be serious repercussions. If things went wrong, a bad crop year for instance, the emperor could be held responsible and even overthrown. When such an overthrow would take place, it's understood that the emperor had lost mandate of heaven. So yeah, ancient China was actually just really classy and fair about how they overthrew people. Number three is ritual music system. So divided into two parts, ritual and music, each side had a purpose. The part of ritual is to divide people's identity and social norm, forming hierarchy. Meanwhile, the music is based on that hierarchical system's etiquette, using music as an alleviation of social conflicts. Developed from older shamanic traditions, it seemed to have a cosmic significance and representative of balance between yin and yang, the fire element. By regulating ritual and music, it strengthened the people's concept of hierarchy in society and played a role in establishing authority and standardized rulings across civilization. Seeing music and Rituals surrounding it divided by class structure is truly unique, as it's unusual only being found in this region of the world at the time. Dance at the time in China was also associated with sorcery and even shamanic ritualism. Documented in ancient records, there are examples of performing rain dances in times of drought. It was also believed you could communicate between God and man via dance and music. Number two is the meeting rites. Who knew meeting someone or introducing yourself could be so complicated? Meeting rites were important and differed per individual, especially as gifts were presented in accordance to this ritual. Ordinary people and officials had to kneel when seeing an emperor, and low-ranking officials did the same when meeting a high-ranking official. To meet an official of any kind, you were to visit their reception and deliver a name card request. You may only see that official if the request was approved. It's all about respect. While the most complicated it would get for officials to meet one another was to do a slight bow and fold their hands in salute, it was a lot more trouble to meet noblemen. A nobleman's host would be greet visitors at the door and 
they would exchange bows before and after entering the doorway. Naturally, dinner would always be provided for a guest before they left, but they did bow to one another before and after exiting the doorway once again. Ironically, commoners actually had stricter greeting rules. They should always move to roadsides to greet officials, and if sitting in a wagon at the time themselves, they must hastily exit at the first opportunity to show respect. They were also expected to have high respect for one another, otherwise they could be punished, especially if meeting rights between the sexes were breached. Men and women genuinely weren't allowed to meet face to face at the time, and if they had to, then the women were usually in a veil and would curtsy slightly, all ten fingers closed together over her heart. Should you be meeting the elderly, you must be incredibly serious, look steadily forward and do not move your hands or feet. If they were to gift you something, you must accept it with both hands. You use a gentle tone and speak slowly. If you were to encounter an elder on the road, you must speak if spoken to, but if not, stand aside young gun. And now for number one, you may need to respect your elders, but don't forget to avenge your parents. A real law that existed for some time during the Ming Dynasty and a few others was that one must avenge the murder of their parents. The reason for this, as I'm sure you can guess, goes along with the heavy respect for elders in Chinese culture. While that's not unusual by any means, many cultures have this mindset, the open encouragement of this type of revenge is very unusual and unique. Especially because you could still be punished for this revenge even if it was encouraged by society. You're not supposed to accept the living in the same world as someone who has killed your parents, as they were seen as the enemy and scourge of the earth. For this reason, many revenge stories were spread through Chinese literature. Well, we are all done for this video. Thank you so much for tuning in once again, and remember to comment down below if you'd like to see more content such as this. Be sure to like and subscribe to see more of our regularly released content.